So, uh, our last speaker today is uh, Nati Bergman from the University of Western Ontario in the Geography Department. Okay. So, my two partners are uh, Norm Greenbaum and Uri Schwartz. This is a project that uh, we started about 10 years ago. Uh, you can see the flood here that I will talk about. It's one of them. And this flood was a major event in Israel and Jordan. It caused a lot of damages. Show why. So this is a climate change conference, and we could see here that in the past the Dead Sea was connected to the Sea of Galilee, and during the Ice Age, more or less, 70 to 14,000 years ago, uh, it was a huge lake. Sea of Galilee here, Dead Sea in the south, and that tells you that in order to sustain such a large lake, very large amounts of water came in. And at 26,000 years ago, that lake reached its maximum. We're talking about uh, 50 kilometers to the south of the current Southern Dead Sea, and about 30 kilometers north of the Sea of Galilee of today. So a very large lake, and 200 meters above the present level of uh, the Dead Sea. So today, Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea are two separate lakes. They're more than 200 kilometers apart. They're connected by the Lower Jordan River. In the last 50 years, it's an ecological disaster. Uh, everybody are using the water. Israel is damming the Sea of Galilee. The, the Jordanians and the Syrians are damming the Yarmouk, the largest tributary, and the Palestinians are using the trickle that is left there to irrigate their crops. So we're talking about a drop of 40 meters in the last 50 years. Uh, so this is a declining lake. It's a terminal lake in the first place. How deep is it? Uh, there's quite a lot. Okay. <laughs> there's, it will never dry up because it's so saline. Okay. It's hyper saline, so it will never dry up. It will reach an equilibrium at some point. Uh, and today we're talking about an area that is hyper arid, less than 100 millimeters. I'll talk about that also in one of the slides. Uh, less than 100 millimeters of rain as we move up into the area here, it's mountainous, so much more rain, up to 400 millimeters, so Mediterranean climate, Judea and Samaria mountains. But we're talking about today a completely different system than it was during the Ice Age. So this is the big climate change. And this is the event that I'm talking about on October 29th, 2004, so 10 years ago. Uh, high magnitude, low frequency floods hit the Dead Sea and completely disconnected southern Israel and Jordan. You know, nothing could basically be done on that day and the following days and causing massive damages. This is how it looks after the aftermath. You could see roads that are cut, uh, a lot of debris, uh, greenhouses, trucks that went down. Somebody was smart and trying to cross a river. Uh, this is one of the reservoirs, this is one of the tractors that was not in the right place. So this is a major event, it's completely disrupting the area, although there's not a lot of population. There's still a lot of, a lot of infrastructure, reservoirs, and property, whether it's public or personal. And the major damages were to two industrial plants. So the Dead Sea today is basically a huge industrial plant. And the Israeli Dead Sea Works and the Arab Potash Company, the APC, are extracting minerals. It's one of the largest operations in the world. So potash, bromine, and magnesium, and other minerals. And you could see an example here of all the dikes. The southern part of the Dead Sea today is completely artificial. It's being fed by the northern part but it's by a canal. It's not really natural, so these are two completely separate lakes today, and these are completely industrial. You can see here that what I'm showing you here is basically these pools, and as the sooner they get closer to the industrial plant, they're able to extract the various minerals with different concentrations. So we're talking about major damage. First to all these dikes that were breached. We're talking about uh, 
fresh water that came in. Fresh water are the enemy. We do not want fresh water when we're extracting hailing minerals, salt minerals. So once you have fresh water coming in from a flood, this is the most disastrous event that could happen to these two plants. So uh, after that event, the Dead Sea Works invited us to assess the October 2004 floods. They had damages that were unprecedented. The plant itself was completely underwater. And the, the, it's a 24-hour plant. So the employees that were there were evacuated by helicopters. So this was a major event. And we were given to assess from a various point of view what went down there. So the first goal was to, to improve and understanding the origin and dynamics of the extreme measured rainstorms and the resulting floods. To put these floods in historic context, so when I'm talking about historic, so it's first of all the measured record. So we're talking about something like 50 years backwards. I'll touch that in a second. To put these floods into a longer term historic context, so this is the paleo flood record. Then we're going back thousands of years back. And eventually, once we are done with our part of the project, Golder Associates, which are a very large geoconsulting company, are taking our data and improving the recurrence intervals of various structures. And that way, they're eliminating future damage. So in terms of methodology, I will talk about a few things, how we did our work. And we could see here that do, when doing paleo flood work, we're looking for evidence. We come to a channel, a river that is dry afterwards. And we're looking for slack water deposits. Slack water deposits are usually sandy. And they're deposited in areas that there's low energy. And it's very easy to see them. So I have an arrow next to those sandy deposits. So these are called slack water deposits. Paleo stage indicators and high water marks, as they sound, you could see here all the vegetation. You can also see that pole there, electricity pole. It's eight meters high, the vegetation. So that tells you about the energy of those floods. This is a canyon, eight meters. You could see a person next to the arrow, a car. So eight meter floods and tells you about the energy of a flood of this double, let's say, the size of the ceiling. In terms of methodology, uh, hydraulic modeling, doing cross sections in the field. What the program does is we're, doing, we're giving it cross sections. This is the river. And the program is basically connecting it and giving us the peak flows. And also obtaining the paleo flood data from previous studies in the Dead Sea area. In terms of uh, the weather at this time of the storm, so storm reconstruction using satellite imagery, real-time radar imagery, and radio gauging station. So the results. Uh, so we could see here the various basins. Each one, is, each one of those is a basin. And we could see numbers next to it. So this we had to do, and although I begged them not to do it in summer, it was 50 degrees when we did it. Because they had to do it in August, of course. Uh, but that's, uh, you never see that in a slide. It's always a very dry slide, and you don't see the heat of 50 degrees Celsius. So every number here, somebody actually went to the field. In most cases, it's us. And we could see that most of the big floods were concentrated in the southern part of the Dead Sea, entering the industrial ponds. So this is the area, this is Nahal Tsin. And we could see that as we go along downstream, the floods are increasing rather than decreasing. So this is the same slide as before, but concentrating on the southern part. And we could see that, as I said, it's increasing every time that we go towards the outlet of Nahal Tsin. This is the Dead Sea Works. And this is very unusual for a desert flood, because in desert flood, you have something that is called transmission losses. And that means that the alluvium, which is the gravel layer, 
is swallowing the water. And as we move downstream, there is usually less and less water. But in this case, it was completely the opposite. And that made the flood more and more severe as we move downstream. And obviously, that's what the reason that it hit the Dead Sea work so hard. If we look at the measured data, so there's not a lot of gauging stations. It's an area that doesn't have a lot of population other than tourism and a few small settlements. Uh, the longest operating gauging station is in Sdom, which is basically the Dead Sea Works. Uh, we could see from 1960 till 2005, annual rainfall between 8 millimeters to 113 millimeters, and 46 millimeters as the average. Relationship between peak discharge and flood volume in Nahotzin, this is past data. We could see pretty good relationship between them. And then we could also see that there is a relationship between flood duration and volume. And in cases that the alluvium is wet, the duration is longer of the floods. Again, cumulative rain amounts in selected gauging rain station. We could see that it goes up, reaches up to 70 millimeters of rainfall, which is very unusual. In, in about three, four hours, the whole amount of a year. If we put these rainfall amounts on previous data, that we could see that it completely changed the curve. So this is in percent here, and this is a daily rainfall amount. So this is the new point, and here it's the annual incidence probably in percent. 10 minute, 10 minute rainfall, we could see 170 millimeters per hour. We can see here completely moving the curve upwards. This is how it looks from satellite imagery, so complete coverage of that storm of the Rift Valley towards Jordan. Radar images, we could see that the storm was moving pretty slow. It was just sitting on those basins and just dumping the rain in a very systematic way. Uh, so 46 millimeters an hour over a relatively large area. As I said before, as we move downstream, most storms are decreasing, but in this case, it's increasing as we reach the outlet. So a co completely opposite trend to what we usually see. This is an interesting one. Uh, this is plotting the paleo flood records, which is the A curve, the envelope curve. Here we have peak discharge, and we ha here we have the drainage area. So A is the paleo flood record going back thousands of years. But we could see that in the past, obviously, we had larger floods than today. This is before we had the floods of 2004. That's B. And C raised that curve upwards towards the paleo flood. So this is the new one, C, the measured floods of 2004. And then we started thinking, so what was that event really? And there's two weather systems that are affecting the Eastern Mediterranean. One is the Cypress Low. And I brought two examples here. A system coming from Cyprus. It's very concentrated, and it's dumping a huge amount of rain in a very short time. On the left, we have 263 millimeters in five hours. And on the right, in 1998, the last day of 98, 240 millimeters in seven hours. So about a third of the annual rain amount in a very short time. The second system is just like we saw the ARST, the active Red Sea Trough, in frequent weather phenomena that is associated with extreme precipitation, flash floods, and severe societal impacts in the Middle East. It has six different stages that I will not go through. But you can see it's coming from Africa and the Arabian Peninsula and hitting the eastern Mediterranean. There are reports that occasionally this storm 
is hitting all the way to France and Italy. On the other hand, the Western Mediterranean, and I'll show a slide, next slide, showing a map of that, is affected by the now, and now is the North Atlantic Oscillation. Two, two modes of that, which is the negative and the positive modes. The now is defined as the anomalous difference between the polar low and the subtropical high during the winter season. The positive now shows a stronger than usual subtropical high pressure center and deeper than normal Icelandic low. And the increased pressure difference results in more and stronger winter storms crossing the Atlantic Ocean on a more northerly track. The negative one enters the Mediterranean. So it's affecting all the, west, the Western Mediterranean, about all the way to Crete. And there's various studies that are showing that the negative now is associated with very large floods. This is how it looks. So this is the positive, and this is the negative. This is the Mediterranean here, and it shows how that wet mass cyclone enters the Mediterranean, but it does not cover the eastern part of the Middle East, the eastern Mediterranean. So this is associated with very large floods in the western Mediterranean. We look at it from a different way. And we concluded that the ARST, the active red sea trough, uh, was extreme in all parameters, including intensity of up to 175 millimeters an hour, probability of about half a percent, duration of about two hours, and rainfall amounts that are 74 millimeters and very low probability, about one to two percent. So this is about 50 to 100 year storm. The resulting flood in Nahatsin, which is increased downstream, also had a probability of less than one percent, was effectively contributed by a very small amount of the area, about 18 percent of it, which is very unusual. Specific peak discharges in small catchments exceeded values of 50 cubic meter second per square kilometer and were up to 18 cubic meter per second for basins of 50 kilometers. So again, probability of a 100 year flood. We had to replot the envelope curve, having an estimated probability of 1%. And it was exceeded by several floods in all catchment areas. The increase in flood frequency is evident in historical and paleo flood in agreement with other studies in the Negev Desert in northern Israel. This trend also agrees with existing paleohydrological and paleoclimatological evidence, such as the Dead Sea level. The trend of increase in the frequency of extreme floods in southern Levant over the last century or so contrasts with the hydrological trend of the Western Mediterranean, which has been correlated to the now. And this finding suggests that these are two different weather systems. So different hydro-climatological environments as well. And there are several studies that are corroborating that. And some of this presentation we already published in global and planetary change in 2010. And we're still playing with that event data now and we'll probably publish it next year. So acknowledgement to these four organizations that helped us doing the reconstruction. And I'll take questions. was that uh, what was previously believed to just be a one in 100 year event, you had to redraw the envelope because you were finding evidence that actually these kinds of events are happening more frequently than that. So I was curious um, what the, how in turn Dead Sea Works, for instance, um, reacted to this news. Because I, I had the impression from the story you were telling about this project that um, Dead Sea Works uh, was interested in having scientists like you take a closer look at this I, presumably because they were worried about whether or not these kinds of events uh, would happen more often. Yeah, so, yeah. so well, they come from a point of view that these events are threatening their livelihood. Yeah, right. So when, when we told them this is a 100-year flood and 
this considering that there is not a lot of data. So yeah. if we're talking about 50 years of data and it's not a lot, yeah. they need to completely change their entire infrastructure and make it to be able to be resilient to much larger floods. So after that, we submitted our report and Golder submitted their report and they completely changed the whole dikes and dams infrastructure in terms of doing the work there and uh, making it much more resilient to floods of this sort. Uh, obviously, we assume that these floods can happen you know, much more often and that's what the evidence suggests. So they're pretty worried. You know, they had damage that was not only at that point, but it was also future damage that they could not maintain their minerals for a very long time. This, it took them about three years to return to the previous state and the Jordanian side as well. So we're talking about big money and they're willing to put that into the, their infrastructure and they have a lease from the state to just do almost whatever they want and they put pretty amazing structures to do everything they can to block those floods. So it now looks very different than it was in 2004. Yeah. Do you know what flood standard they use? Um, you know, what, 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 what did they plan for the one in a hundred year, basically? Yeah, usually they plan for the 50 or 100 year flood. Uh -huh. And it's also usually systems that have one defense and one fails, there's another defense. And in case everything fails, they have a problem because yeah. it reaches their infrastructure. Uh, usually they work with the 100 year flood. That's the standard in the engineering industry, in the geoconsulting industry. But the problem is that you need to give them a specific number. Yeah. And also, you saw the extent of the area. Yeah. And they have huge amounts of pools and huge amounts of infrastructure. So this was to put millions of dollars in just restoration of those dikes and make them much more resilient to future floods. But, but in brief, they, they took this flood as a 100-year flood and planned for that? Yeah, we, usually they also put additional Beyond that, you know, you don't do the hundred, you know, this already happened, you take an extra precaution. Uh, an engineer sometimes they do some amazing things when it comes to that. Yeah. Well, thank you, Nathaniel. And if you have more questions, you can continue uh, later. So thank you, Nathaniel.